Dear friends, glad to see you all. It's Saturday, 11th of June, 3 minutes past 10, Kiev time, and we are starting another stream, day 108 with Alexei Rostovich. Glad to see you. Good evening, everybody. All right, 137,000 people are watching us. <laughs> it's pretty amazing how many people are gathering here to watch us on a Saturday evening of summer. Um, yeah, you know, we've got an audience of our own that cares about the events unfolding. Um, everybody, please share links to the stream in your social media so there'd be more people watching us and getting the information. Subscribe to Fagin, subscribe to Alexei Rostovich. If you are watching that in English, subscribe to the privateer station. All right, what uh, have you got for us? Any good news? Um, probably among good news is my good mood and strong belief in our success and some stories about what's happening on the front today. Let's go around the map. In Chernigov and Suma region, they are doing some debauchery, shooting, artillery duels. Now we're showing Kharkov. Uh, can I see that? It's, it's our old Kharkov map. Okay, I'll just do it by memory. They are fighting near Kazacha Lopin. It's a very north part, North Strait 12 from Kharkov, where the red marker is. <clears throat> also, it's almost around the whole perimeter in the Kharkov region, from the north, from the east, and a bit from the south. So, yeah, you can see Kazacha Lopin, that red spot up top. It's not too big, but if you're watching it on a cell phone, you can zoom or maybe you can open Google Maps and look for Kharkov and up top there is Kazacha Lopan. Ternabaya is on the south and on the north it is Bayrak and Bershevaya. This is relatively close to Kharkov and they keep shelling the city. Citizens are hiding from the artillery attacks in the downtown. This does not have anything to do with uh, hitting military targets. It's pure attacking civilians. So what do you think? Is it trying to distract resources so nothing is drawn down south to Severodonetsk? Yes, I think so. It appears to be an attempt to keep us busy up north so we would not reinforce Severodonetsk area. Where do we go next? Let's go Severodonetsk. Papasna, Severodonetsk, the whole region here. Just waiting for the tablet to update the picture. There is a bit of delay. So from Izum, they were holding and doing intel and artillery at first, but now they started to move. Um, there is some fighting around Bagarodishna. Not too quick and not too fast. Not too strong of an advance on their side. That's a good map if you zoom in, but on the screen, yeah, it's hard to read it. We need to think how to give it technically in a better way. But I'll just try to guide our viewers. And Severodonetsk, it's on the right, where there are two long red arrows hitting, aiming towards it. Russian army is trying to use aviation on it. They even hit one big tank with uh, ammonia, and there is a risk of uh, ammonia damage to both sides of the conflict. The fight is going on. They try to advance near Mitelkina and Tashovka. It's towards south 
It's kind of a southern protrusion from Lysychansk and Donetsk. The first one that's on about three or four o'clock. And they're trying to take it. And they're trying to close it in three directions near Lysychansk. So first is from the east. And they're trying to advance from the southeast to northwest. They're also, they still trying to cut the road, Bakhmut Lysychansk, near Berestovoya, unsuccessfully so far. And they're also trying to advance to Bakhmut and see if they can cut the road there. Overall motion is pretty understandable. They're trying to cut the road near Papasnaya Siversk and close that cattle. They're trying to, this goal has not changed. They're just trying to change tactical approach. They get a little bit successful, then get hit by artillery and fall back. So if not to go too deep into tactics, which is not the task of this show, we need to keep a general overview of the front line. On the general front from Bakhmut to Lysychansk, they're trying to cut this road. And Liman group that was advancing, it is trying to proceed towards Slavyansk, is looking for a way to cross Siversky Donetsk and take something on our side. According to some information, they already crossed it in one place and took a little bit of a bank, but on the other data, we're still fighting, so it's a fog of war. The idea is to cut the road between Barvinkova and Slavansk. So in general, you have to qualify that north, northwest, northeast of Ukraine uh, got into motion. What is uh, a nice surprise for me in all that is that Russian troops are taking longer pauses to continue their active offensive maneuvers. Roughly speaking, if after a week of active fighting, they would take three days off and continue with another week. Now it's one day of offensive, two days of a pause, one active day, two passive days. So of course the war will continue, but the pauses are definitely growing, which is a sign that uh, the opposite side uh, troops are not in a good stance. If you're feeling good, you advance for a week, fight for a week, take a breather and then rotate or go back in fighting. And here they fight for a day, do an active maneuvers, after that, they take two days off and basically do nothing, recuperate. Today, they tried to attack Avdeevka, Krasnogorovka, everything above Avdeevka. And then their aviation also decided to work in Marinka. But in none of those regions, they managed to advance. So they're basically trying to do whatever, anything. Uh, if they cannot advance, they're just trying to prevent us from any active moves. And perhaps they're also considering that if they are, they've pulled all the resources near Severodonetsk, and they're thinking maybe we need to throw, or we are throwing more reserves into that area. And we're not, we're happily sitting in the defensive positions there. But uh, it does appear that they require, require some restocking some new bodies to continue the offensive. So they're trying to see to, to tighten us there so we have no force or no way to attack them. And perhaps because they're a bit afraid that we might and they don't have resources to stop us. Um, can we open Zaporozhye? There's some movement there as well. How my intuition suggested they did not go to Zaporozhye, they went towards Arekhova. So if you're looking at the map now, at Vasilevka, which is on the border of Dnieper, 
It's the red dot near the blue water reservoir in the left right corner around 7 p.m. So if you look from there towards 3 o'clock, maybe 2.30, you can see the city Arekhov. It's a yellow spot on the road. So they're going towards Arekhov. And what they're doing it is because we've done something that we keep doing pretty successfully during the whole war. We're waiting for them to be ready to advance and then hit them right before they do. First time we did it on near Kiev, uh, I think it was the first, or fourth or fifth day, I don't remember exactly, but they were going to attack us at five in the morning and our troops at 11 p.m. near midnight attacked them in that area and broke their ranks. So that was a bad theme for them. They could not attack. They needed to address our counterattack. And we've repeated that move several times already. So here we also did the counteroffensive, generally in the Arekhov direction. If our viewers could zoom in, that would be beneficial and I could give more names, but otherwise, let's just say Arekhov. And our troops advanced from Arekhov towards the Silivka at the bottom, uh, did some counteroffensive maneuvers. So Russians, instead of, or not Russians, Putin's uh, command, instead of pushing the troops towards the north, towards Zaporozhye, they had to turn right and do some counter operation activity, which looks like anything, but not like an advancement, not like a proper offensive that they have planned. So we basically canceled that effort there. A very similar event happened in Kherson about 10 days ago. If we can look at Kherson, here is the map of Kherson. There is a village called Snigurovka, where there is some fighting going around it. It is smack in the middle of the map, and there are some fights around it. We're surrounding it a bit from the north and a bit from the south. And towards the south, we have a few fortified positions. And if you look at the road here, San Nikolaev, let me zoom in on my side. There is a village called Pasat Pakrovsky. It is a blue dot on the road right above the red line. This is where they try to counterattack, trying to stop our movement. And we have some pretty good defensive positions there. On the right side of Ingulets the river. So in some parts they're trying to hit us directly. In some parts they're trying to do some maneuvers around. But we can say that today they actually are being active and some of their motions are rather logical, nothing new. They're still working in the same areas that they did before. They likely got some reserves and they're trying to continue the operation because they have no other option, literally. Our artillery is working also today. I'm not going to tire you with a list of successful hits. Today we have hit a bit less times than yesterday, but not less bright uh, or not less valuable targets. Hit a few ammo depots, uh, gas supply depots. And I can give you some city names near which we were successful. For example, near Takmak, that was one. Near the town of Cherivna, Charming, near Kherson region, near Perislav. So we've hit several good tasty targets and we will continue this is just what i'm aware of there is a lot of information coming so this is what we have checked so far and there were other hits in Papasnyanska, Kharkovsk and other directions but uh, that data needs to be verified so if to summarize the results of today, 
Russian side got some reserves and are proceeding with counter-offensive actions. But good to notice that it is counter-offensive. So there are Zaporozhye and Kherson where we have initiative and Kharkov is also our initiative. So out of five active areas of uh, fighting, three on three, our initiative belongs to Ukraine. On two, it belongs to Russian troops. And good thing that we do have uh, weapons. Our artillery keeps working, and that's very important. And every time we praise artillery, we need to also mention another group of uh, troops that is uh, vitally important for artillery to be successful. This is uh, intel, military intel. So we need to say every time when we say artillery hit, we need to probably connect them both and say it's military intel and artilleries. All right, we have 307,000 people watching us live, despite it being Saturday. We've been only about 15 minutes live. Please do not forget to share the links to this stream, and it is important, you know, you know it. Okay, um, another subject, maybe after our streams, maybe not, but uh, people are saying that in some TV channels in Germany, we are being cited, and uh, they're citing us with uh, in a not a nice way, probably because you showed them the middle finger and they probably received the gesture. But today the ambassador of Ukraine, Melnik, to Germany had actually named the dates of um, supplies to arrive, and one of them is June the 22nd. Uh, I don't know how symbolic is that in terms of Second World War, Germany and USSR, beginning of conflict, but um, what do you think? So it's not just the dates that are that we see, we also see the quantities. It is the first time that I'm hearing dates and quantities. So you think that media field is putting some pressure. You think they called our ambassador to their uh, ministry and told him, don't be nervous, something like that. I suspect maybe that's what happened, but they did name quantities and terms. On the 22nd of June, we are expected to receive some howitzers, Panzer 2000, uh, anti-aircraft, uh, Gepard uh, 15 units before the end of July, 15 before the end of August. So they promised 50, now they're giving 30, which is still good. And our ambassador used an opportunity to shame Germany that out of everything promised by a day 105, actually it's 108 today, that nothing came from Germany yet in terms of hard armor. Also another matter that Spain tried to give us some of their armor, some of their tanks, German-made tanks, and somebody prohibited them from doing it. And let's uh, clear something here. I'm not uh, attacking Germany. I'm not uh, showing middle finger to Germany itself. I lived there for five years when I was little, and my first children views of the world were heavily influenced by Germany, by galleries and arts and culture. Secondary, I do know what is going on in Germany, and I know that the fact that Ukraine is not getting heavy equipment is a decision of very few people, that most people are supporting us, and uh, a lot of politicians are also uh, willing to support Ukraine. I've been giving and talking to German channels Deutsche Welle the other day. So I understand that. And we have to be thankful to Germany because the amounts of money Germany dedicates for our refugees and all kinds of social support, that's in billions of euros. So once again, we are very thankful to German government and German people, uh, government in a wider sense of the word, and German lawmakers and uh, German press, and I think I, I just gave 10 interviews in that time to their leading media, but there are certain politicians that are making these exact decisions. 
and somebody did stop Spain from giving us 40 tanks. This is somebody who has a name. This is a fortified tank battalion that could solve a lot of tasks on the front, but we're not given that. That means the blood of our soldiers, it means the blood of more children and the blood of our citizens and continuation of war, prolongation of war. How can I react to that? Well, no questions there. I, I understand that. And I think uh, Germany will too. Um, at least it's moving from the dead spot where it was before. Spanish tanks is an interesting matter. But yeah, let's see what it goes to. Perhaps there'll be some official announcements or actions. What do you say about that light bickering between Biden and Zelensky? Biden mentioned that he did warn Zelensky before the war, having the intel that Russia is going to attack, that President of Ukraine was given that information. And Zelensky apparently dropped the ball, according to Biden. We saw that Michael Padalak responded to that and other officials around Zelensky addressed that. It is somewhat an important question because you can hear that, that uh, people are blaming Ukraine government for certain decisions. But I think it's always better to bring it, some sunlight to that and discuss it. Of course, it's always better to make it visible. And we could see that leadership of Ukraine was trying to avoid escalations, to avoid some hysteria and try to also resolve certain tactical military matters. But let's discuss what is uh, a good critique from Biden, what is not such a good critique. Because it somewhat reminds of a critique of a girl who was raped that she was wearing a short skirt. So to attack Ukraine this way that they did not react properly to the warnings, it's somewhat doing a passive defense of the main guilty side that actually perpetrated the attack. Let's follow the facts here. In October, Labuda, the director of uh, Intel in Ukraine, said uh, what? He said the war is guaranteed. He even drew the map, how it will be going. Then it was a bit of a noise. Did it happen? Yes. It, he's the head of the main Intel department in Ukraine. He, last quarter of the previous year, he said the war is inevitable and you can find it in press. Did we need Biden? Did, did Budanov need Biden to make the statement? No. As the head of uh, military intel, he saw the plans, he saw what was going on. Did we hide that from society, from our citizens? No, we didn't. We made a public statement. And I'm only going through what I remember, just on top of my head. 3rd of December, Minister of Defense Alexei Reznikov says that attack is imminent, practically imminent, and we need West to give sanctions and to give us more weapons. Presence of these two things can either affect the scope of this offensive or might even cancel it. Did we get it? No, we didn't. You can actually invite him to a conversation. I can invite him here. So if he has time, he might come. He's a little busy, softly speaking, but he might tell you more that about what he, what and how he was asking from the West in October, in November, in December, in January, and what was given. So nothing was given. In November, there was no discussion about any stingers. They already were telling us about inevitability of attack, but refused to even, not even give stingers, just to even discuss them. So I have a question. The West basically is saving us now. It's saving us financially, politically. It's saving us militarily. If they were not helping us or did not help us earlier and did not work on the sanctions, we probably would be talking about defense of Lvov, or at least the right side of 
Ukraine. Not because we're cowards, but because we're running out of physical resources. We're holding this defense line to a greater degree because of the Western support. We are feeding Ukraine, we're keeping the economic situation stable, greatly because American support. And Biden did mention that Putin also wants to destroy culture, our language, our history, our right for independent existence as a nation. But let's not forget that Ukraine was not quiet. Ukraine publicly, publicly in a public media field with voices of the top of the political apparatus, the head of the defense system. That's top enough, right? He basically said the attack is imminent, not even choosing words. And he was saying what we need to stop that advance of Russian side. We were given maybe 10% of what we asked for. And we did not ask blanketly, we asked very purposely what we need. Would the West mind explaining why it was just 10% or why right now they're only giving 10% or why right now they're giving so little from our real needs? They're giving enough to help us save ourselves, but at very minimum. The Ukrainian side, of course, has its own drawbacks. We had a big side of our political sphere that was discussing and stating that there'll be no war, or there'll be a very small operation. There was other side that was supporting <coughs> the opinion that Russia will attack the whole country. We were preparing for war. We had territorial defense sprung up. We called on the reserve troops, especially when we knew, learned about the dates and had some specifics. And there was more data that civilians do not see or, and luckily will never see. And when, you know, when a soldier in his detachment thinks that he was not sent anywhere in a certain time and he was not given a personal javelin, that the army probably was not ready for that offensive. But if we were not ready, how come it is day 108 and we're still fighting? But with all the gratitude to United States, a collective West, Britain, Germany, uh, European Union, why in these small quantities and why not to take the initiative? These questions do not disappear. So if it is time to ask questions, I can ask these questions for myself, not, not as an official figure, but as Alexei Rostovich, just the war talking head. When we asked and showed and showed our analysis and calculations, we showed the roads, times and frames that we knew about this attack and we told what we need to save our country and people. The main thing is that they had everything and yet we didn't, we're not given anything. Well, how do you explain that? Why did you not, why were you not given it? I think they did not believe that we have a capability to defend ourselves, that we're incapable of standing to Putin. Uh, I think that was the answer I was expecting to hear. Uh, that's the way their analytics works, Mark. It's um, they, they made in that time frame last year three major mistakes. They made a mistake in, in terms of uh, Afghan army to defend itself. They gave them half a year, they were mistaken and left a lot of weapons for billions of dollars. Second was the capability of Ukraine army to self-defense was completely underrated and Russian Putin regime capability to carry out an offensive, major offensive was absolutely overestimated. But their geopolitical calculations were built on these mistakes relations with us, attempts to build relations with us were based on those mistaken calculations. We have our own drawbacks and we should discuss them and bring them up, but probably after the war, when it's over. We have our drawbacks and we have very big mistakes too that we made. And when the time comes, trust me, I'll be one of the first people who will talk about that and some ears will fall off 
upon listening, hearing what we know. Because I am pretty skilled at criticizing our pitfalls of Ukrainian army. But these questions still stand when we basically beg them on our knees to give us certain kinds of munition. Uh, and even now we're asking them, hey, can we need, we need this, this and this? They're not even letting those 40 tanks. Or when we ask for HIMARS system, we get four. Of course, these four are for training, nobody gives the real number. Then I have a next question, when the real number will come? Why the tempo is so slow? We do have results. We can show results based on the artillery that we already received. We, where we get support, we can absolutely deliver. And there is another aspect to that, where Elizabeth Truss from Britain um, was addressing this matter in a very straightforward manner that is characteristic to her. She said, we made a capital mistake as a collective West. We believe that geoeconomy will change geopolitics. We opened access to technology to Russia and China, to Western technology, to Western markets. We came to them and we aided them with everything. And then she said that these wonderful regimes, especially Putin's, they used all that might and all that faith of the West to fortify their authoritarian influence and at first to attack that West. Did we not find German transmission in Russian panzers? Do we not find French television, uh, heat vision systems, heat censoring systems in their aiming assemblies? How much blood did Ukrainian soldiers pay for that? How many families are missing their father, uncle, son, because French supplied those heat sensors and for aiming systems, and Germans supplied transmission systems for the Russian armor. I'll tell you what's the responsibility of the West. They helped Putin to grow up. They legitimized him and they continued to prop him up. Part of the West is still supporting him. And it's not just me saying that, it's Poles, for example, saying the same thing. And they do suggest, hey, why don't you, France, give part of France to Putin to help save him, his face, if you want so. That's why I said that as well, and I keep saying that. Everybody is guilty. So if it is time for fair questions and fair answers, let's ask fair questions and look for fair answers. Why did Germany give 60 billion more to Russia so he could kill more? How do you understand that? I think they don't care, to a degree. When you put on the scale the lives of Ukrainian soldiers, our wish to survive, to be a, become a nation, to stay economic unit versus their own problems, they always will select their own problems to solve. It is hard to take, to accept, when you have 100 soldiers dying daily and when you get messages telling you friends and family and Relatives are dying almost daily out in the front. But that's a personal sentiment. Let's put it aside. Let's stay in the field of analysis. But then there is a next step in this chess game that they need to consider because it is addressing their interests. Imagine, it's an intellectual fiction. Imagine that Putin won. You add 1.5 million Russian army, add another half a million of Ukrainians. People know how Ukrainians fight. Everybody, I think, who's watching the show knows that Russian Federation did not win a single war besides that small war with Georgia in the last 200 years without Ukraine participation. They won the wars with because Ukrainians were helping. And all that machine, that military machine, might eventually move on to Europe. Where are all these European armies? Many of them, they're very small-scale armies that do not really have the capacity to defend their country. Where will they stop the union of Russia and Ukraine and Belarus if that happens? And this is their direct interests. 
And those people who understand that, Poles, Baltic countries, Brits understand that, Canadians, Americans get it. They completely support us, or try to, as much as they can. Estonia gave us 30% of their military capacity because they gave it. They, they know that it's every tank hit here in Ukraine is the tank that doesn't get to Estonia. We're stopping the tanks with our blood, those tanks that might go to Europe. You realize that they might, may, because everybody a few years ago thought there is no war with, with Ukraine. And even here, they, they're planning to sit down and discuss and make a peace treaty. Should I remind them how migrants were attacking the borders of Poland and borders of uh, EU? That is another way to create a war. So, some countries do get it. Sweden decided to stop their 200 history, 200 year history of neutrality to support us. And Finland understands that too, because tanks burnt in Ukraine will not come to Helsinki. Some people in Europe think that the war in Ukraine is far and at maximum it will be the high gas price and we need to sit down and discuss it with Putin and maybe help him understand that he made a mistake, play it back, maybe give him a little bit of Ukrainian land and sign Minsk III agreement. No, it won't. It will never be good. This is not a solution. And in a, perspe in a longer range perspective, it does affect military interests of Europe. If Putin wins here and if he takes Ukrainian resources, he will attack Europe. Because according to his calculations, he will win that war in a high probability. Not in complete victory, but with a high probability that Europe will have to sit down and offer some peace treaty. And Europe, and then European soldiers will be dying in German leopards that they are not giving us. So with all the mistakes we done, with all the corruption we had during the years, especially in the military production area, we're not taking down the questions why, when you have the capability to support that fight, the tempo is so slow. And why did when we asked to support us to do preventive preparation, we were given so little and so late. I did not even quote President and Koleba because they also did that. I know Budanov, who was the end of uh, October, the 3rd of December, Reznik, and the president was saying and addressing that, and the head of the office is his political advisor, who is responsible for information, political support, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They all made statements. You can find it in the press. Because some people like to, especially from some Ukrainian opposition, that everybody was warning us and we were just saying, no, nah, nothing, nothing happens. Just turn Budanov at the end of October, his message then, turned Reznik of 3rd of December, but then they were giggling and saying, these guys are crazy. And now they're screaming that we did not estimate the danger proper. We gauged it properly. Back in October, I knew when the war will start, even to a date. And I was giving that message as well. I could not state it publicly up, out front, but not publicly. We did push that information and make sure that we are ready as much as we could for it. But I know what happens in the negotiations with partners. And when in November Reznikov was begging to give stingers because we have nothing to shoot down Russian helicopters or airplanes with, he was answered that it is not even possible. We are not even going to discuss that when we knew the date of offensive. How to explain that? Or Minister of Defense Reznikov and Zelensky are two very different people. This is President's vertical. Foreign policy is President's responsibility as well. Everybody has their own share of responsibility. Uh, President was not the one who put landmines or took them off in Shingar. He is not doing the operative maneuvers in the front, but 
political statement, political position is definitely his responsibility. It's just that it's upsetting when people are bringing it up and saying that we did not say anything. This is not true. If you bring up the materials, we can see that we gave them details of possible Russian maneuvers, possible Russian offensive routes, and what needs to happen here, and how we're planning to defend ourselves. So, I do not believe the theories of conspiracy theories about that being related to October or November elections in America. I think it's just the slowness of political machines. And we are being punished for our mistakes, trust me. We, we get it every day. But if we are asking questions, I'm going to be asking these questions too. And I still have to say that our life indeed depends on them. The fact that we continue talking and our life depends on their support. So we're grateful. But life is a complicated thing and there are two sides to every question and answer. And, and Alexei, you know, that's uh, an interesting conundrum here when people are discussing, when allies are bickering. It seems like the main offen offender is standing on the sideline uh, and people are bringing that he needs to have his face saved. So this is a good contrast for questions. Um, 390,000 people are watching us live. We've been for about 40 minutes live. Uh, Mark, uh, come, oh, Alex, you're coming tomorrow? No, Mark, tomorrow I need one day off, please. All right, a warning to everybody, we're letting Alexei for a day off. He asked for a day off, officially. Um, also, I want to say that we found the mother of daughter, a mother of uh, that girl we showed who lost her arm during this war, and uh, we found the contacts, and we're sending them 2,000 euros for expenses to help in these days. So everybody who wants to support the families in Ukraine, the ones we are bringing up in the show, please uh, come to Open Sea, make your purchases, make your bidding, and everything will be used to support the victims of this war and their families. And uh, Alexei, yes, as for the family of uh, an officer you knew will address this question by Monday because it's the weekend, so banks are not quite operational, but by Monday we'll figure it out. So please share links to the stream, subscribe to Fagin, to Alexei Rostovich and to the privateer station. And uh, don't forget to leave your like because it brings this show, the stream to 10 more people by the algorithms. So tomorrow we're just taking the day off. You can have a drink and relax a little. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Alexei. See you Monday. See you Monday.